much. Um, well, it's a pleasure and indeed a slight surprise to be opening um, this conference today. Um, some of you might know I'm a stand-in for Emma. Uh, I'm a poor, I'm not even a copy actually, I'm a poor substitute for Emma Cavill. Um, but Dr. Emma Cavill has had a little girl who, and she is doing very well. Both mother and baby are doing fine. So instead you have me talking about uh, women in medieval Welsh law. Now, the quote in my title, and I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, Philip, could you just give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Yeah, good, thank you. Okay, so Philip can see it anyway. Um, and my screen isn't going forwards there. Uh, there we go. So the quote is from Oscar Wilde, the quote I've got in my title. Oscar Wilde said, women have a much better time than men in this world. There are far more things forbidden to them. Now, working on medieval Welsh law, I would tend to say, I tend to agree with Oscar Wilde, in fact, because there are far more things that were forbidden to women in Wales in the Middle Ages. Now, it's often said of medieval Welsh law that women had more rights. Um, it seems to be this sort of urban myth that's gathered around medieval Welsh law that people think, oh, yes, it was fairer to women than, say, England was. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's true at all. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is have a little overview of medieval Welsh law and what it has to say about women. Um, I am going to look at the limitations, but I'm also going to have a brief look as well on the roles women could play in law and the things that they were actually allowed to do um, in terms of participation in the legal sphere, their roles as witnesses and their roles in legal situations and certain capacities. So in many ways, this is going to be a bit of a background picture to the two papers that follow today. So um, Dr. Messer will be going after me and she will be looking at Queen Joan. There's gonna be a bit of a contrast there, I imagine. Um, I'm looking more at women in general, but the situation perhaps with the elite is a little bit different, um, but that's Dr. Um, Dr. Messer's paper, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then, We've got Dr. Beatty, who is then going to be looking at wills and um, the consistory women's uh, women's roles in the consistory court in Hereford. Now, looking at court records is not something that's open to me. Um, I look at written law rather than the court records because there aren't very many records from medieval Wales. Um, therefore, that's going to be quite an interesting. Um, well, I'm really looking forward to both papers this afternoon. Yes, I am because I don't think there are that many wills in in her record. Um, somebody's got their mic on. <laughs> Would somebody like to put their mic off? Um, <laughs> right. Okay. So, what I'm going to do to start oh, with. Oh, Sarah. God. Sarah, yeah. I'm going to mute all. So yeah, I'll, I'll, unmute. I'll mute all and then you'll have to turn yours back on. Yeah, good plan. Thank you. <laughs> right, I'm back on, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Philip, take that opportunity to mute me because <laughs> it's not often that anybody can do that to me. <laughs> OK, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to have a quick look in general on medieval Welsh law and what it was. So, um, oh, my slides aren't moving as I would like. There we go. So the law of Howell, that's obviously a photograph of King Howell Tsar, Howell the Good, who died in 950. It's not a photograph. There he is looking very, very stressed um, because there's a lot of medieval Welsh law and they're quite complicated to read. That's why he's looking quite miserable in that picture. So medieval Wales had its own system of law, which was separate to common law in England and separate to the canon law, law of the church as well, it was a homegrown system um, specific to medieval Wales um, and very sophisticated. Now the law is attributed to King Howell ap Cadell, also known as Howell Tha, Howell the Good, and he died in the year 950. Now there's very little concrete evidence to link the law texts that we have with the figure of Howell Tha, um, this 10th century ruler. So the existing manuscripts of Welsh law are later, I'll be talking about that in a second, but the existing manuscripts date from the mid 13th century, the earliest manuscripts are from the mid 13th century, which is a bit of a gap from the year 950 when Howell Tha died. 
Um, but Howell might have developed, he might have had some interest in law, he might have developed some legal system, but he certainly didn't write books of law. If he did, they didn't survive, but it's unlikely that he didn't write any books of law. Um, the attribution to Howell there might be later. Um, it, there's, there's a story in the law books and the prologues of his legal activity, um, gathering, putting the laws together. Um, that might be a later thing that was attributed to him to give the law a royal and ecclesiastical basis and also as a defence against the criticisms of Norman clerics. Norman clerics were very hard on Welsh law, particularly around the time of the conquest of Wales in 1282. Um, and the law of women was specifically criticised. So um, that's, that's going to be quite interesting to look at. So we don't know what Hoel that did. He may well, if there's any, if you were looking for a candidate for legal activity in early medieval Wales, Hoel that is your man. He had a period of relative stability and had a, you know, a good situation for lawmaking, but there's nothing that can definitely be linked to Howell um, in terms of any evidence. So the law, it survives, Cabreth Howell, as it's known, the law Howell, it survives in over 40 manuscripts, 42 manuscripts, actually, medieval manuscripts, and they separate into different groups with common attributes. Um, so the order of the text or the wording of the text, in fact, is quite similar in many of these manuscripts, but none of the 42 are copies of, of each other. They're all independent texts. So the groups known as redactions are named after eminent lawyers. There's the Latin group, which have the common attributes of being in Latin. The other manuscripts are in Middle Welsh. So you've got the Covenants group, which is seen to be the oldest form of the text. You've got the Blagorid manuscripts, which have a South Wales link, and the manuscripts, most of the manuscripts date from the 15th century, um, some from the yeah 15th century. And then you've got the Yorwerth manuscripts. Yorwerth is very much a North Wales group from Gwynedd in North Wales in the 13th century. Um, and the manuscripts of the Yorwerth redaction tend to be earlier manuscripts. They tend to date from um, the 13th century. Um, so you've got these three groups, which I won't be referring to very much, um, but what we have in these manuscripts is codified law. So they are a book of law. Each manuscript is a book of law and is intended or was intended to present the entire law or the law in its entirety. Um, it's a codified legal system written out as a book. That's not what was going on in England, but it was going on in other places. Um, the law texts, they all follow the same basic structure um, and they're arranged into subject specific sections known as tractates because the whole alliteration of subject specific sections is not easy to say, um, especially at the end of a long day, which this isn't now. So the law is organized into tractates or essays or, you know, sections on specific subjects. There I go again. Now, dating the law is a huge problem because there's a big disparity between the date of the text, which is the writing the law, um, and the date of the actual manuscripts. Manuscripts can be dated with some certainty. Now I've mentioned several manuscripts are dated say to the 13th century. Now the earliest manuscripts of Welsh law are dated to around 1250. There's uh, two or three of those. Bear in mind, there are no manuscripts in Welsh. There are no Welsh language manuscripts before 1250. So law manuscripts actually are among the earliest manuscripts in existence in Wales. However, you've got manuscripts dating from 1250, but the text in those manuscripts can be considerably earlier, and most of it is considerably earlier because they're copies of earlier texts. Um, so dating the law is a bit of a problem. And not only do you have a disparity between the text and the date of the manuscript it was written into, You've also got the problem of the tractates, these sections of Welsh law, and even different sections within the tractates can be a mixture of early and late editions. And they're not necessarily following that order. You don't necessarily get the early bits first and then the later bits at the end. They can be all mixed up. So um, you sometimes it's a case of dating individual sentences um, because the law was always evolving. It was an entity which was ever evolving, I'm at the alliteration again, ever evolving entity, the law of Wales. So the, the dating of any section of the law is not going to be uniform um, throughout. So it's quite a complicated thing. The law itself, let's leave the dating and the problems of that behind. Law itself 
it was on the whole very sophisticated and highly developed this isn't something you know written well it's not something that was created you know locally it was created by lawyers for lawyers drawing on the wider european tradition the law was compensation based and every individual had to take responsibility over his own actions and over any matters which could cause injury or loss to others and if any events did occur where somebody caused injury or loss to another um, or to their property then compensation had to be paid this is because um, in medieval Wales did not have a strong state structure throughout much of its history you had um, various princes would come to the fore various kingdoms would be leading sort of if you like Gwynedd for example in the 13th century was you know the strongest kingdom but um, that's a kingdom and not the entirety of Wales the law was to apply to all of Wales and so what you have is a system that will work whether or not you have a strong ruler at the top um, so you can if you have a strong ruler the law will still work if you don't there's all these compensation structures are written into the law in order to ensure that everybody gets what's due to them so there was that and the main focus was on compensation rather than punishment of the wrongdoer this is not a moral code mainly because you don't have the state structure to enforce that kind of thing so you, there's no emphasis on punishment only doing right by others and everybody nobody losing out basically and as a result um the death penalty is pretty rare in welsh law there are references to the death penalty being applied in certain severe cases of theft but not for homicide it's assumed that homicide happens openly incidentally um but so the death penalty is rare and the texts do seem to take every step they possibly can to avoid applying the death penalty for, for theft. There's all sorts of, there's all, there's more of an emphasis on when you don't hang a thief um, to when you, when you do. And the main reason that theft was punished so badly was because it was a stealth act. Now, if you have a society that needs to function with a legal system and without necessarily a sort of ruler at the top to enforce it, you need everybody to work together. A thief in your midst um, acts secretly and nobody knows who the thief is. And therefore that could undermine the whole of society and indeed the whole of the legal system. So stealth acts are extremely serious in Welsh law. Any kind of secret or concealed act, severe, really badly punished. So let's look at the law of women, which is the main thing I want to look at today. Now, the Welsh law of women is one of the tractates I mentioned it this there is a section in the laws dedicated to women and it was studied um, and published as a book um, in 1980 um, the, the book that book I've just put on the on the PowerPoint there the Welsh law of women um, was a study of the women tractate an edition of it um, and um, st studies on individual chap chapters on individual aspects of the law of women it's still very much the first point of call for looking at um, the women material in the laws. So what do we get in the law of women? Well, women were largely treated as chattels. Um, according to the tractate, um, they were really, they didn't have very much value as human beings, they were objects, and they had no right to hold land and very limited rights over property as well. Now, because one of the big subjects in Welsh law was tenure and the inheritance of land, always, um, women do have a role to play because women obviously produce the children um, and they can produce these children both within normal situations and also in other situations, as in women could have babies without being married and all sorts of things like that. Um, but this emphasis on inheritance and continuing the family line and every male um, adults being part of a kindred group to have their legal rights. This explains the focus in the law of women on unions of different forms. And that's the main, uh, main emphasis that we do get. Now the tractate itself occurs in all of the redactions and all of the manuscripts or complete manuscripts. And it's an attempt to bring together all of the rules on women. Um, mainly women as chattels, as I said, the main focus is on unions and marriage and rules deriving from that. Um, so it's a little bit lacking, really, when it comes to women's integrity, integrity and any rights that they had outside of their roles as wives, as it happens. This is all very negative at the moment. Just in the run up to St. Valentine's Day, we're getting the negativity of women being treated fairly badly. Um, also, 
Despite the fact that the track date aims to be definitive, this is everything you need to know about women in the law. Um, as with all track dates in Welsh law, it became fixed fairly early on. So it has a fixed form, but there's a lot of material on women found outside of the track date as well. Um, you get materials throughout the laws. For example, you get additional rules where relevant, if you're looking at land law, um, women bear the sons who take, who have a share in land. Therefore, you get some rules up there. You get some rules in contract law explaining, you know, the very limited roles that women could play, uh, could play in contract. So while you've got the track date and it's very useful, it's not everything that there is on women in the laws. And the material that you find outside of this main track date can be quite revealing because it can put a bit of flesh on the bare bones in the track date. But it can also show the developments of the law and you can see changes in the way women were, um, were being dealt with in the law. And this development can often reflect the way society was changing as well. So let's look at marriage. Now, marriage in Welsh law, um, the picture there is from Peniath 28, um, the earliest manuscript of the Welsh laws in Latin, and it's a picture of a couple kissing. Um, the woman is on the right, in case it's not obvious, which it isn't necessarily. The men in the laws have not fancy hairstyles. Um, so in general, marriage was a contract rather than a religious sacrament. There's no detail on the ceremony in the laws. And there's no detail on any moral obligations because that was all the domain of the church. Um, the basic situation in the laws is that for a full legally accepted marriage in Welsh law, goods would be exchanged as a contract. Um, and these goods were exchanged to seal the contract and finish the job. So the man would receive his new wife and she was expected to be a virgin. Sometimes they would put a guarantee on her virginity. Her family would put a guarantee on her virginity. Um, so he was expect she was expected to be a virgin and that's what he would get. And the woman would then get some payments. She would get this payment called the coish. Um, there it is there. That's largely equivalent to the morning gift in English uh, law, in early English law, actually. Um, the coish is a morning gift. She would get that as a payment for her loss of virginity, really. Um, and she would get that um, after consummation. And then she would also, on the day of her marriage, name her Agwedi. Now, there is no sort of English translation of this word, the Agwedi. Agwedi um, was, uh, she would name financially viable items from the husband's good, her new husband's goods. Okay, not huge amounts. She wasn't allowed to name land and she wasn't allowed to have, you know, an entire stock of beef cattle, but she would name some financially viable things that she would have. And the reason it's a sort of insurance payment, this Agwedi, um, the goods would be hers to keep if the husband left her, if the marriage ended without good cause before seven years had passed. Because seven years in Welsh law was a trial period for marriage. And after seven years, everything was split half and half. So the contract was sealed well, not by shaking hands. The contract was sealed by the couple, well, having sex, with the wedding guests, the Nithiorwyr, as they call the wedding guests, would stay um, presumably in a different room while the couple went off to seal the deal. Um, and the wedding guests would be present because if the man wanted to say that his new wife was not a virgin, he had to do so there and then. He wasn't allowed to stay in bed until the morning and say the morning after that she wasn't a virgin. He had to do it straight away. And he had to run, well, you know, from wherever he was, away from his wife and into the wedding guests, um, still naked. And, well, it says with his penis still erect, um, to show that he was able to do so, to and say that she wasn't a virgin, in which case the contract wasn't sealed. Um, the marriage wouldn't work and that's that's a whole other situation that happens and it's not the kind of wedding ceremony i have ever been to and ever want to go to but there we go that's how they're old in medieval wales um so the couple have married and all is well um except not for the woman because a man was allowed to beat his wife um the laws say that there are three situations where a man is entitled to beat his wife um, he could beat her for giving away a thing which she is not entitled to give, and there's a list of what she's allowed to give away. Um, for her being found with a man under deception, um, I like, quite like the fact that the Middle Welsh says, well, the equivalent of under deception, which suggests that she can be found with him if, if it's agreed between them, they're all right, but only if she's doing it sneakily. 
and she can also be beaten for wishing a blemish on his beard, um, which is slightly odd, I know, but those of you with uh, full beards here, those gentlemen with full beards can be very, yes, I can see Philip's actually got a full beard. There you go. Beards are a sign of virility in medieval Wales. Um, if she's wishing a blemish on his beard, wishing that his beard, gr beard grows badly or doesn't grow at all, like the men in my family, incidentally, uh, <laughs> if she does that, she is casting aspersions on his um, performance as a husband, uh, which is very serious. And she's doing it publicly as well. Um, so he could beat her. And so if he wanted to beat her, he could strike her three blows with a rod as long as a man's forearm, as thick as a long finger, and he can hit her any place except on the head. So great, you know, that sounds marvellous. Now, um, I mentioned that a marriage in medieval Wales was a trial period for um, the first seven years. Well, after seven years, it is said that everything is divided half and half. Now, the word for this is uskar, and it's the same as the modern Welsh word for divorce. Uskariad is the same one, but it literally it doesn't mean divorce because that's not a concept, but it's separation. So the woman is under her agwedi, that insurance payment, until the end of seven years, and that's what she gets if she's, if she's left. Um, and then um, after that, um, it is right for them to share everything in two halves. And the laws tell you how to share everything. Pigs for the man, sheep for the woman, there's only one kind sharing in two halves, so if you've only got four pigs, then each gets two. If there are sheep and goats, the sheep for the man and the goats for the woman. Of the sons, so if there's any children, male children, who cares about the girls? Uh, of the sons, two thirds to the father and one to the mother, the eldest and youngest to the father and the middle to the mother. So the mother gets the difficult middle child in that setup. Um, so that all sounds very clinical and indeed quite odd. Now, the Norman clerics looking at Welsh law came down on the law of women, you know, heavily because, according to the church, only God was allowed to separate a married couple. But the Welsh were clearly saying, oh, yeah, well, anybody can choose to marry after seven uh, to split after seven years. But there's actually a hidden sort of subtext here. The woman gets, so this is a continuation of it, the woman gets a car and a yoke to take her equipment from the house. Uh, incidentally, early reference to the word car in Welsh, which is borrowed into English later on. She's not actually getting a Vauxhall Corsa here. She's getting a truck. Um, truck the yoke, though, a car to take her stuff from the house. The man gets the upper stone of the quern and the woman the lower. Now, this is a little hand mill for making, uh, for making bread, for grinding um, grains. The bedclothes, bedclothes which are over them to the woman and those which are under them to the man. Um, and then to the woman belong the pan and the trivet and the broad axe and the hedging bill and the plowshare. Now, all of these things seem quite reasonable, dividing half and half, but none of them will work. So the quern, the two pieces fit together. You've got two stones that fit together. Now, if you take one away, you can't grind your bread. So if you've got one stone from a quern, that's it. No, no making grain. No making flour. Um, you can also bring in a new stone, but it won't fit because the two stones fit together neatly. So that's a bit useless. Bedclothes. Well, you will all know that if you don't have bedclothes over you, you're going to be pretty cold in medieval Wales in winter with no heating. Um, but if you don't have any clothes under you, you're going to be sleeping either on a floor or on some straw, which is going to be horribly uncomfortable and filled with bugs. So you don't even have a proper bed. And then the other items the woman gets the pan and the trivet, but she gets the broad axe, which is the big axe. The man gets the little axe. So the broad axe is for cutting down trees. The hand axe is for making firewood. She gets the hedging bill for dealing with the hedges and she gets the plowshare. Now she gets an actual plow. Now these are all divided. So all of these things are too heavy for the woman to be able to use, but also you can't do anything um, because if you've got the broad axe, you can chop down your tree, but you can't make firewood. And if you've got the, if you can, if you can make firewood, you haven't got the tree. So basically, all of these divisions are suggesting that it is better for the couple to stay together because nothing will function if they're apart. So that's a sort of little hidden things. So I mentioned that women had uh, very limited roles. Now, women were not. I mean, what women were not allowed to do in medieval Wales is a very long list indeed. Um, women were not equal to men. They didn't hold land and they didn't inherit land. 
So the statement that women is not entitled to have patrimony, she's not entitled to status in one hand. So the woman is not allowed to inherit land. I'll turn back to that shortly. But not having land takes women out of most major events in law and completely limits their importance in society to almost nothing. Women were not allowed to speak in court. They're entitled to a representative in court. Now, these are people who are entitled to a representative, um, but in some cases they would have to have it. A woman would have to have a representative speak on her behalf because she's not allowed to speak in court. Uh, an alien, a foreigner who couldn't speak Welsh would have to have somebody to speak for him. And a stammerer in the same way had a speech impediment and therefore had to have somebody speaking. So women were not allowed to speak in court. They're there with, the, with people with speech imped impediments and people who couldn't speak the same language. They are in a different class altogether. She also didn't have any female compurgators. So uh, compurgators are oath swearers. They swear an oath to support an accusation, so oath of good character. She's not allowed to have female, only male compurgators. And Margaret Owen in the Welsh Law of Women sums up the situation that women, in most legal situations, she, like the dumb and the mad, was regarded as a non-person. So in general, women have very little independence. Everything depended on either their fathers or more importantly, their husbands. In fact, the law is rather silent on what happened to women who chose not to marry. There may have been women who chose not to marry or couldn't find a husband, but who were never married in the first place. And they're also silent on what happened to widows. Um, widows didn't get a share of the land and any separated woman who had separated from her husband, um, they explain how if they separate in life, she stays with what is hers in the house until the end of nine days and nine nights. That's just in case she's pregnant, um, to know whether their parting is legal. If their parting is proper, let her goods go before her and after the last penny, let her go herself. So off she goes. It makes me think of a cowboy film, which is why I put that picture up. Off she goes herself into the future, but we have no idea what happens to her after that. Uh, the silence on what happened to these women who weren't married, didn't marry, married, widowed, um, they are, I mean, it's telling, they were of no importance whatsoever to the lawyers, because the only purpose a woman had was to produce heirs, and the focus of the law was on inheritance, so as long as the heirs were secure and the inheritance was fixed, it didn't really matter what the women did, so they don't feature in the laws because they have no interest or no value. But there are some situations which related specifically to women and meant that these rules couldn't be followed to the letter and women were allowed to take part in court in certain special situations because they were doing something a man was not able to do. Now, one of the rules, I am not going to be reading out this quote, but one of the rules um, suggests that in marriage cases, if a woman claims that her husband is impotent, then she's responsible for showing proof of this and the quote on the um on the sheet uh, on the screen there says how she's to do it um so it's highly interesting in my view because um the law orders her to be tested there's no question of that the middle welsh reads that's the feminine it's her that's being tested not him it's a feminine um pronoun so it's her that's being uh tested so it's rather revealing. It's her word that's under question here, not the man. The man has to be tested, but only to make sure that she's not making, making this up or whatever. So she has to check, you know, but she has to show that he is impotent. In accusations of rape, now rape is dealt with very badly, really, in my view, in the track date on women, because if a virgin says that the man has raped her, um, she has to prove it. And it's again, it's her that has to be tested. Um, so the person who has to test her and to test whether she's a virgin or not is the edling. That's the heir apparent. That's the um, king's eldest son, usually could be his brother. Um, so he gets to test this girl who has just been raped and has said that she's been raped. So he tests her to see if she is a virgin. And if she is a virgin, then the man, um, if, if she's not a virgin, then he's in trouble the man has to pay his um, marriage dues. Um, if she's a virgin, she doesn't lose her status so she can still be married. Missing the obvious point here that she has been tested in a way that no longer makes her a virgin, but there you go. That's the cruelty of the whole situation. Another situation where women could take part in court is, oh, that's a lawful charge of rape, incidentally, which I don't want to focus on too much, um, but a woman, again, has a role to play here. But the women are made to go through quite 
harrowing ordeals by modern standards, really, because um, they have to swear. And it's their word that has to be proven, not the man's. Um, so, yeah. So other situations where women can take part in court is in paternity cases. Now, um, in paternity cases, a woman would need to, if a woman had had a baby and the father was unknown, the woman would need to attach him to a father so that he had all his rights, um, according to the kindred. And the law states that this is only the mother could do this. If the mother's dead, then other people can do it instead of her. But really, it's the woman who has to assign a child to the father. Um, so, and woman's suretyship, I don't want to discuss that because time is going on because I want to turn instead to look at land law, but suretyship is law of contract. This is a section of law that's been rewritten. I'll go back to this at the end if anybody's interested. That's been rewritten fairly badly because the law has changed. But what I want to talk about now is women and land. Now, women weren't allowed to hold land according to the laws, but in some later sections of text, there are new procedures that you see references to, and one of them is this one, mamwis, and it's inheritance on the part of the mother. So the inheritance runs through the mother's line. And these are extreme cases. So a woman who's married to an alien, to a foreigner who doesn't have Welsh kin and no Welsh land um, and other situations. But children in these cases could actually, these are special cases, um, where there's no father's kindred, the inheritance goes down on the mother's side. Now it's called mamwis. There's a triad, um, oh, there's a section in the laws that also discuss different ways of claiming land. And again, this is a later bit of law and mamwis makes it in here as well, mother rights. It seems to have suddenly become an accepted way of claiming land. Um, and in later collections of laws, what you have is a short triad, the triad I just had up on the screen, listing three things, but it's been expanded into a really, really long bit of law explaining how you claim land through the mother's side. Now, this isn't necessarily reflecting the women's increase in the increased role of women, because in the first scenario, they're discussing uh, the son of a woman who's been given, in fact, in all cases, they're discussing the son of a woman given to others. But they do actually call the woman in the longer case, they, uh, she's actually used in court to show that she had Welsh family and therefore the son could have a role, a share of land. So the fact that there's more of these Mamois cases in the later texts, and there are, that suggests that there's an expansion in this kind of situation. So there's more of these. And it's certainly the case that women were beginning to play a bigger role, although it's not really reflected in the laws in the same way. And this is likely to reflect the changes in society after the conquest, and certainly in the March of Wales, where society was far more mixed and there was far more influence from England. Um, so it would be unrealist unrealistic in the March and later medieval Wales to assume that the kindred purity Welsh thing would carry on, and it didn't carry on. So the changes and the expansion in this section of law reflect the changes in politics and society in Wales in the Middle Ages. So just to finish, Rhys Davis, in his article in The Welsh Law of Women, he argues that land tenure and claiming land was more relaxed in outside of Gwynedd in other parts of Wales and the March. And it may be that in these texts, more prominence is given to Mamwys cases because it's reflecting actual practice. It may have been a known practice earlier on, but a rare thing. But by the post-conquest period, it was necessary to have more of this kind of material written down. So the basic position of the laws is that there are far more things forbidden to women and they have very few rights in the law. But as time goes on, there's a subtle change, although it's very subtle indeed. And there seems to be more flexibility, particularly in land inheritance. I'm not saying that women were allowed to inherit land, but the inheritance could be passed through the female line. And that's certainly a development and, a, you know, uh, an increase in the role that women could play rather than just producing the sons. In the court roles and evidence outside of the law text, there's very little to suggest that widows could hold land and there's no evidence of dower land. Um, this seems to be an English practice that wasn't carried over to Wales, except Emma Cavell has published a paper on this very situation where noble women or royal women actually could and did use dower in order to be able to benefit from the English aspects that weren't lacking in Welsh law. But it may be that this reference to the practice of land being passed down the mother's side 
reflects not only the uh, relaxation of the attitude towards women and their rights to land, but the situation and the major changes happening in society itself and a situation which was no longer accurately represented in the traditional Welsh law texts. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, excellent. Um, if Kirsten, if you could um, be unmuting and turning your video on, please. Um, <coughs> yes, can you see me? Thanks, Kirsten. But uh, yes. Um, yeah. um, right. I'm afraid to say there's a deafening silence. <laughs> oh. That's often the way. <laughs> well, I, there was a couple of things that um, I, I, I was going to, to say. Uh, one was, um, yes, uh, thank oh, you. I had uh, one, but I'll let you go first. Right. Philip. Okay. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for saying what I should have said, <laughs> which is, I should have explained that uh, you had very kindly uh, agreed to stand in at shortage notice. Uh, because, uh, oh, it's all right. Because Dr. I'm very good friends with Emma. She owes me one now. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, yes. Uh, and, uh, I mean, people will uh, know uh, Emma because uh, she's spoken to us before and is a member of the society. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure uh, you know, people would wish to add their congratulations that uh, Emma uh, gave birth to a baby about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, Martha? Sarah? Baby's oh, name? Martha, yeah. Martha, yes, I thought, yes, Martha. Uh, I thought that was right. Uh, so yes, so many congratulations uh, to Emma. And I hear that Emma and Martha are both doing well. Yeah, they are, they are. They, I mean, she's born under strange circumstances in this pandemic, but yeah, they're, they're yeah. doing well, she's thriving. Yeah, so, so yeah, but so yes, particular thanks, uh, Sarah, for standing in at, uh, at shortish no notice uh, and, and, giving, and giving us uh, an excellent talk. Um, I thought what I was just going to explore a bit with you was that in, in any era, if you look at the laws, you're going to have a negative perspective, aren't you? Because, yeah. because by their nature, laws are dealing with everything that might go wrong. Yes, yeah. And yeah, that, you don't get any happy ever afters in law if you look at legal history, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so law is by nature is dealing with what people might, you know, what people might do that society deems bad um, and, and what the punishments should be. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, now yeah, we, you know, clearly, yeah, we know that doesn't reflect the law. Yes, there are a certain proportion of people who break the law and, and who are punishment, but it doesn't affect, it doesn't reflect, you know, it, if an alien was looking at the laws and assumed that was the totality of mankind, then that's, we know that's not the case. So sorry, this is getting a bit lengthy, <laughs> but you, you get, you're getting my gist, I think, in terms yeah, of, yeah. Do, you think, do you think there is an element that actually in practice, uh, the lives of medieval Welsh women were, were better than, than portrayed in the laws? Yes, quite likely, because the only real interest in women in the laws are as, well, conduits, you know, producers of children, producers of male children as well. Um, but there's a definite sense throughout all of the laws and in pretty much most aspects of the laws, this is written law written before the event, not written after, not like common law written the response to something that's happened. So what you have is lawyers writing situations, you know, we might need a law for this, that or the other. But those laws might never actually be used. So you have a situation where they say, yeah, a virgin who's been raped, you know, she has to go through this cruel procedure. It's quite likely that, you know, this wouldn't actually happen in practice. And, you know, you might find that her word was accepted. The man might say, yes, it was me. I did a terrible thing. You know, so it's likely. And we all know that quite a lot of agreements and Dealings and interactions with people happen outside of the legal context. I mean, if you go to a court of law today, lawyers and barristers spend a lot of their time in the waiting room settling cases before even going in to see the judge. Um, so not criminal cases, civil cases. <laughs> but um, you've got so you've got. Yeah, I think it's not reflective of. Um, yeah, it's a very bleak view, but it might not necessarily be as awful as all that, you know, um, 
There's also some, there's the very occasional, there's one lovely bit, one of my favourite bits is on the payments to the wet nurse or any woman um, breastfeeding a, a noble born child. And that is rather lovely. And it's clearly been written by a man who has seen a woman bringing up a child and seen a woman breastfeeding a child, probably a husband or a father or a, you know, a man who has seen this happen. And the payments are absolutely beautiful because she gets extra warm clothing and a candle. She gets a candle for a whole year because as we know, babies wake at night. I'm sure Emma knows this right now. Babies wake up at night invariably. And if you've got no lights, you know, it's miserable. So she gets warm clothing to wrap herself up while she's feeding the baby. It's lovely, absolutely lovely. Right, so Kirsten? Yes, the first one is from Lynn Marie Taylor and she asked, did women have to take responsibility for their own crimes? Ah, oh, good point. Um, yes, good question, which I didn't cover, but yes. Um, to a great extent, no. Women were treated in the same way as children, as men under 14, boys under 14. Um, they weren't fully legal persons. So there are very rare references, very sort of few references to women stealing with their husbands. But it's always assumed that it's the man that's the leading thing. And it's, just, it's kind of assumed that the woman, women, yeah. If, if the women steal, it's because their fathers or their husbands haven't looked after them and should have stopped them. So the woman's husband is her, uh, it, the woman's lord is her husband, and therefore women don't really have a full legal, um, well, responsibility. Okay. Um, I have another one from Joe Lane Smith, which is, is there evidence outside of the laws that we can use to understand how widows sustain themselves? Um, yes, although there's not a great deal of evidence from medieval Wales. Um, the best option really is to compare it to what was happening in England, but it's a very, that's a very difficult one. And widows are a huge problem if you look at medieval Wales. It really is a, a problem because you've got this massive disparity between um, the laws, which don't tell us anything, because the laws really don't discuss widows, and you'd think it'd be quite a serious thing. Um, so the laws don't discuss widows. Um, you don't get very much in court roles and the like, because women really weren't allowed to inherit land in medieval Wales. Um, so yeah, it's it's a problem. It's a problem. There's, there's a general lack of evidence. Yeah. Um a, a sort of a slightly more light-hearted one here. Does the phrase seven-year itch come from Welsh marriage law? <laughs> Everybody asked me that, actually. <laughs> I, I keep on being asked this. I have no idea. I don't know why. Um, the seven, number seven, the Welsh lawyers wrote their texts with a heavy emphasis on numerical ordering. There's certain good numbers. Three is the best. Um, I did my thesis on triads, so I don't know about three, but seven is another, another magic number. And the Irish are really keen on the number seven and organizing things into seven. Seven years, it's a strange number. It's, it's an odd number in both senses. Um, it's an odd number. It's probably giving them seven years. So if a girl was to get married at say 16 or 17, if within seven years, the couple haven't had a child, then they're not likely to be having a child. And so she would be free to go and wouldn't be too old to be able to, you know, have a baby with somebody else, I guess. So I think it's to do with the fertility aspect. But where the seven year itch comes from, I don't know. But it's hilarious that it's the same. <laughs> um, and then possibly finally, Alistair Aiton. Um, he says, I have a question. It seems to me that there are a lot of scenarios outlined. Um, that were probably open to interpretation at best and corruption or abuse at worst. Is there much evidence which bears those suspicions out? Uh, incidents of false accusations of rape, uh, which were later discovered to be false, uh, done to defame women or her original family? Well, the big problem there is evidence. Um, what we yeah. have is what the laws say are supposed to happen. What the law says is supposed to happen. Mm. We don't know whether these things actually happened, and we don't have court records. Um, so we we don't have other other records. Um, I mean, the best you can do the prose tales. The Mapinoki, the four branches of the Mapinoki, have an, uh, a woman who's accused of being a vir of not being a virgin. Um, and it turns out she's not either. But that's another story. But their their prose tales not actual law. So evidence is a huge problem. Right. Okay. Um, one more from Connor Williams. Um, he says, my thesis investigates wardships in the 14th century. Uh, the position of widows upon the death of their husband is often murky. 
uh, with children appearing, um, being put into the custody of guardians outside of their immediate family. Um, did the widow have a clearer role in Welsh law in the upbringing of minors following the death of their husbands? Nothing said. Nothing uh, said. We have, yeah, no evidence on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is that it, Kirsten? Uh, yes, I'm sc scrolling through. Um, seven years is apparently a important number in English canon law. That's uh, Dr. Beatty. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. Yes, well, it, well it, it, it has good biblical roots. 